So I was asked to speak on heroes of Muslim Jerusalem or Muslim Palestine, and I'm going to challenge myself and your attention spans uh, to reel in two primary objectives for this talk. The first one is going to be to try to create a, a mind map or sort of a, a linear timeline of the history of the sacred blessed lands of Palestine through mentioning 10 personalities, 10 personas in chronological historical order that graced these blessed lands, our heroes, or graced their, its people. That's the first objective. The second of them is to, while doing that, highlighting some of the less popular heroes of Palestine so that we can widen our, our conceptualization, our notion of what a hero is and what heroics are so we can fit ourselves inside of it, inshallah ta'ala, so that we can grow by that widening uh, our desire to be among those heroes because they will exist. We know that much is true. It is inevitable. We know what the last chapter of the story will end like from al-Sadiq al-Masduq, from the one who does not speak on his own behalf, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Hero number one is a young Palestinian child named Yusuf alayhi salam, who was betrayed by his brothers and then abducted by a trade caravan and sold in the slave markets of Egypt then framed for a crime he didn't commit and tossed in the dungeons, but he showed exemplary resilience. Through being anchored in his faith, he patiently awaited for the decree of Allah Azza wa Jal to come to pass. And not only did he heroically survive all of this, but he heroically rescued his family in Palestine and brought them all to Egypt so that they would not be subjected to death by starvation in the famines that were happening in Palestine and elsewhere. And so now the children of Ya'qub alayhi salam, like Yusuf and others, Ya'qub's name is Israel in the Quran, so that's why they're called the Israelites, for those who may not know. The Israelites now live in Egypt. And the stage is set for our second hero, which is the Prophet Musa alayhi salam. There arises to power in Egypt a ruthless tyrant known as Fir'aun, known as the Pharaoh of Egypt, who enslaves and slaughters the Israelites, the children of Israel and their families that had migrated generations prior. And they are saved in heroic fashion by Musa alayhi salam, who carries them out of Egypt and returns them to the promised land of Palestine. Due to their cowardice and rebellion, they were not able to enter just yet. And Musa alayhi salam went his separate ways with his people and died in frustration with their resistance and non-compliance with the command of Allah and the command of his prophet. And they were lost in the desert for 40 years as a consequence for their rebellion. And now the stage is set for our third hero, which is Joshua, Yusha alayhi salam, the apprentice and student of Musa alayhi salam, who served him and accompanied him in the famous story in Surat al-Kahf, when he had to go learn from al-Khadr alayhi salam. Joshua, 40 years later, he takes the Israelites finally and he marches into Jerusalem triumphant with Banu Israel. And then Allah Azza wa Jal sends the people of Palestine and these lands their next hero, which is Talut alayhi salam or radiallahu anhu. Perhaps he was a prophet, but he was certainly a righteous man. Who was Talut? It's Sha'ul in Hebrew, and it is Saul in English. And he's mentioned, of course, in the Quran, 
that when Allah elected this man as their king, they said, Ya Allah, we're getting beat up all over the globe. We need a king. Give us a king. And so Allah says, I have appointed Talut as a malik for you. They said, Anna yakunu lahul mulku alayna. They said, how can he be our king? We are more entitled, deserving, qualified to be the kings. He's broke. So Allah chose a poor man to be their king for his righteousness certainly and the qualities that Allah knew of him. And Allah Azza wa Jal, the most wise, was certainly right. His poverty had built in him an austerity that we hear about in the Qur'an that was transferred to his troops, those of them that could handle to march with him. When you get to the river, only take a sip of water, the story said in Surah Al-Baqarah. And that was the army that was able to defeat in heroic fashion a massive opponent led by a living legend named Jalut, named Goliath. And Allah Azza wa Jal sent among the followers of King Talut an even greater king that emerged, this young, extremely handsome young man from where you least expect it, gets up and personally challenges Goliath the legend and with one shot of his slingshot, knocks him dead and destroys the morale of the army and he eventually himself, his name was Dawood alayhi salam, he eventually himself becomes the most celebrated of the kings of the Israelites, of these tribes that live in Palestine, that live in Jerusalem. You know, in the hadith in Sunan al-Tirmidhi, uh, Allah Azza wa Jal showed Adam alayhi salam all of his progeny. And he saw one of them who just stood out, was distinct, had a, such a light to his face. So he said, Ya Allah, who is that? He said, that is one of your great children who will be sent at the end of time. His name is Dawood, alayhi salam. So this is where we get that it is at the end of time, let alone where we are now, and where we get his beauty and his radiance and his handsomeness from. He ultimately became the heroic king of Banu Israel and established the kingdom after taking down Goliath with his slingshot. He became the king who was also a prophet. And then he handed off to his son, the heroic prophet and king, Sulaiman alayhi salam. So we have Yusuf alayhi salam, and then Musa alayhi salam, and then Yusha alayhi salam, and then Talut alayhi salam. وَإِن لَمْ يَكُنْ نَبِيًّا وَقَدْ كَانَ عِنْدَ كَثِيرٍ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْعِلْمِ And then you have Dawood alayhi salam, and you have Sulaiman alayhi salam, your sixth hero. Sulaiman alayhi salam, of course, was the one who solidified the kingdom. And Allah azza wa jal rewarded him by accepting his dua to widen his kingdom in a way because he intended good by it. Not power, not ego, right? Not just domination. Allah extended his kingdom and his influence to the point that even the animals, as you know, even the animal kingdom, and even jinn kind was at his service, were loyal subjects of his. And of what we know about the heroic accomplishments of Sulaiman alayhi salam is that he channeled and harnessed all this power Allah gave him to restore al-Masjid al-Aqsa. And this is what they call in history the, the, the peak of the, of the kingdom of Israel. Israel today is a name that is co-opted from the prophet Ya'qub. Don't get it twisted, right? Alayhi salam to try to wash away the sinister intentions, they are not the heirs of Abraham or the followers of Moses or have any rightful attribution to Ya'qub alayhi salam. But this is why it was called the kingdom of Israel. Because these are all descendants of Ya'qub, Israel uh, alayhi salam. And so he rebuilt Masjid al-Aqsa. And he ruled so justly. And he had the utmost piety and humility. To the point that Al-Qurtubi rahimahullah says that when Sulaiman alayhi salam knew, because every prophet was told, if the final prophet emerges in your time, you stand back and follow his lead. That he used to, he created a ring for himself 
on which it was engraved, none is worthy of worship but Allah. And Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. The beauty in his humility, I'm just here waiting to hand off to the true leader of the prophets. The true leader of humanity, Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam. And he used all of that power, of course, not to be self-serving, but to serve humanity by sharing Islam with them and the exchange that you have in the Quran between him and the queen of Sheba, of Saba in Yemen is well known. After Sulaiman alayhi salam passes away, ills of prosperity, there are power grabs that take place and the kingdom is divided between the north and the south kingdom. And they began to deviate and they began to fall into disbelief and every vice you can think of. And so as a result, Allah empowered against them external enemies one time after another. They were the battleground for the empires that surrounded them. They were once again subjected to so much pain, so much atrocity. They were ravaged by these empires over and over and over again. Until ultimately, Jerusalem landed in the hands of the Roman Empire, which sets the stage for our next hero of Muslim Jerusalem, which was Jesus, peace be upon him. He was born into the period of the Roman reign. And although Allah Azza wa Jal did not give him power in the worldly sense, in the political sense, Allah gave him the impeccable strength to speak truth to power, to be a nation within a man. And he battled the corruption of not just the political establishments, but even internally within the religious establishments. And even the Bible has remnants of accounts of this. He, he threw out the fraudulent rabbis and the people that were uh, commandeering sort of religious language for the sake of their materialistic interests. And he continued to do this fearlessly and consistently until they came after him to ultimately execute him and Allah refused that they be able to do that and he lifted him into the skies and every single one of his disciples essentially was martyred and they too certainly were heroes of the great hero Isa alayhi salam ultimately the Roman Empire takes some turns evolves as all civilizations and empires do about 300 years after Jesus peace be upon him Constantine under direction from his mother he founds the Roman Catholic religion. If you've ever wondered why it's called the Roman Catholic, it's because they tried to sort of utilize the names of these personalities that were heroic and pious and sort of apply them to a pre-existing pagan tradition that existed among them. And so it became that merger of doctrines and it was the Roman Catholic religion that chose a very specific creed called the Trinitarian doctrine, right? As the... And, enforced by the power of the state, and that is what was established in Jerusalem in the year 325, common era, so about 300 years after the birth of Isa alayhi salam, and now we set the stage for the coming of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, the best of Allah's creation and the seal of his revelation to the world, salawatu rabbi wa salamuhu alayhi, and of course Allah leaves no ambiguity regarding those accolades by carrying him in a single night. Before changing the Qibla from Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa to the Kaaba, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala carried him to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa to lead those heroes and prophets in prayer. He could have went up to the heavens from Mecca, but Allah insisted that it go through Al-Aqsa to tie this Ummah before the Qibla leaves it, to tie this Ummah until the end of time with this blessed land the land of prophets and righteous kings and heroes, time and again, and the story is not over. About 10 years after the uh, death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an takes the reins of this ummah and he is our eighth hero for tonight. He liberates Jerusalem and he restores Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. He rebuilds it. He cleanses it. He purifies it. 
He restores its honor and the glorification it deserves because those who were running that territory had left it in ruins, had desecrated it, had not valued it as, as only a true believer in Allah and in the last they would. And at the same time, he left room open, not just for the Muslims, but for the Christians and ultimately for the Jews to live in peace as they did in every period of Muslim run, Islamically informed Jerusalem, that was always the case. And then as the Islamic empire grew and the ills of prosperity creeped up on us as well, Allah Azza wa Jal is not inconsistent or unjust. Equity is for all and it is against all. There is no favoritism. When it caught up with us and we felt it was unconditional as well, that promise of God, and we felt we were God's favorites for a second, the Muslim Ummah began to fall apart in many respects. Which is when the Crusader armies, driven not just by their fanaticism, but by their economic woes, drove into the Muslim Ummah to recoup whatever they could and gather whatever they could muster of resources and new life for their crippling civilization. And so they ultimately reached Palestine, ultimately reached Jerusalem. And they slaughtered everyone they could put their hands on, en route to Jerusalem and in there. It was not just the 70,000 Muslims that were slaughtered in cold blood. In a single attack in the courtyard of Al Masjid al Aqsa. But even the Jews, they were all stuffed into their own temples and synagogues and they were burned down upon them. But this ummah never dies and its obituary will never be written. And this only set the stage for our next hero. Number nine, Salahuddin Saladin al Ayyubi, rahimahullah. 88 years later, he achieves the unification of the Muslims. And he is able to liberate Jerusalem. And he restores once again what he found of a desecrated, defiled Masjid al-Aqsa. And he says to those who had once pillaged and burned and massacred in this place, you are not our teachers. And it was in the month of Ramadan. And he could not help, I'm sure, but recall that the Prophet wasallam gained the upper hand against those who oppressed him and persecuted him for decades, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, because the conquest of Mecca was also in Ramadan. And he let whoever wanted to go, to go in peace, and allowed them to take their belongings with them. And even so many of the combatants who couldn't afford to ransom themselves were let go out of goodwill, or he ransomed them out of his own money, rahimahullah, or because their women or children could not travel alone, so he would send with them entourages and release for them their husbands. And so it returned to the fold of Islam, returned uh, to the sanctuary of the Muslims and Masjid al-Aqsa, Palestine and Jerusalem, until it was overseen by the Mamluks and then the Ottomans. And then finally, Great Britain, which is no longer great, alhamdulillah, colonized Palestine and granted it without due right, of course, to the Zionist Jews upon the fall of the Ottoman Empire in the early 1900s, which sets the stage for our 10th and final hero. Who's it gonna be? No, I mean who among you is it gonna be? May Allah write us all among its next heroes. You see, only those who realize that they were not just nine can muster the inspiration, can muster the optimism to say, maybe I can be the tenth. You see, these nine figures You know, some of them were prophets, some of them were commanders, but what about everyone in between? 
You think they came out of nowhere. You think they came to a time and a place that was undeserving of them. No, they came out of a whole environment, a blessed ecosystem as we were hearing about last night. You remember when I told you that Musa alayhi salam brought them to the promised land, but then they couldn't get in? Let's take a little bit of a deeper dive. In Surah Al-Ma'idah, Allah Azza wa Jal speaks about this moment. And he says that Musa alayhi salam said, Ya qawmi, O oh my people, ادخلوا الأرض المقدسة التي كتب الله لكم ولا ترتدوا على أدباركم فتنقلبوا خاسرين Oh my people, enter the promised land that Allah has in fact awarded you. If you are indeed believers, then it's yours. It was never unconditional. And don't turn your backs. You will be regretful. What was their response? The very next ayah says, يا موسى Inna fiha qawman jabbarin. Musa, we can't do it. There are big, bad, tough people in there. And we will never enter it until they exit it. If they exit it, then we will enter it. We're not willing to sacrifice for it. This third ayah now is what I want to call your attention to. That is the point of reference. Allah Azza wa Jal said, قال رجلان من الذين يخافون أنعم الله عليهما أدخلوا عليهم الباب. Then there were two men. We don't know their names. We didn't count them among the nine heroes. But Allah immortalized their mention in the Quran to be an inspiration until this very night at NJ Dawah and beyond. Two random men refused to mind their business. Refused to be marginalized. Refused to say, I'm not a prophet, I'm not a king, I'm not a commander. In the presence of a prophet, they still took initiative. And they did what? Their part. What was their part? Listen to the prophet. That was their part. Just listen to him. He said, just walk in. It's going to be easier than you think. Allah will strike fear in their hearts. Something's going to happen. Just follow instructions. So Allah praised them that they feared nothing but Allah Azza wa Jal. And they were echoing the words of the prophet. Those two are heroes that the Qur'an made a point to mention. You know, it is just like the story of Sahibu Yaseen. If you open Surah Yaseen to the uh, second page, it mentions that Allah sent a prophet and a second, right? He, he's sending messenger after messenger to call the people to the truth. And they're just being stonewalled. They're finding dead ends everywhere. Then Allah Azza wa Jal says what? وَجَاءَ مِنْ أَقْصَ الْمَدِينَةِ رَجُلُ Then from the end of town, a man comes running saying what? يَا قَوْمِ اتَّبِعُ الْمُرْسَلِينَ Oh my people, listen to the messengers. Why did this man have to be mentioned? In the context of messengers. Because most of us will not be. But it is the greatest honor to be included among the followers of the greatest messenger to echo his call to the world, to be the heroes that initiate whatever we can initiate. And recall this also, Musa alayhi salam was ready, was intent, was determined on liberating Palestine. That's what made him the hero. Did he do it in his lifetime? No, he didn't. But our deen says, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Right? Whatever you intended, you got. So he died while attempting this. And so he is written among those who accomplished this. And so are you. If you stop focusing too much on the result, the immediate result, the when. You know, heroes, true heroes are people that are working blind, working in the shadows. I don't know when it's going to happen, and I'm not getting any credit for it, nor am I even seeing sort of any progress being made, and I'm still working. That takes digging deep within yourself and asking yourself, what drives me? Do I believe in Allah or not? Do I believe that he will make it worth my while or not? Just as the warriors themselves on the ground were heroes, so were, so were their mothers who raised them upon firm faith, raised them upon loyalty to Allah and to his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and loyalty to, to, to this ummah, every last individual that belongs to it. You know, just as the commanders and the generals were heroes, even their armies, every last one of them, 
that didn't get a mention tonight. They are not heroes. You know, think about even the ethical practices, right? The virtue, the magnanimity, the forgiveness, the refusal to enact vengeance that we talk about with Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an, or Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. Do you think they alone had this sentiment inside them that Allah will ask me if I wrong anyone, even if my commander doesn't catch me? This was a sentiment that flowed through them all. Every single one of them restrained their hands. Every single one of them kept working even if they weren't being, getting a, a, not a notable mention. It was the entire army. It was the entire movement. It was the entire period. You know, if I would like uh, capture for you these famous words of uh, uh, the, the scholar of Islamic history, John Esposito from Georgetown University. He says the Muslim army at the time when Jerusalem was liberated at the hands of Saladin, right? Just one of our heroes. He says the entire army was as magnanimous in victory, meaning forgiving and, you know, forbearing and refusing to, to enact vengeance, was as magnanimous in victory as it was tenacious in battle. They brought it all home within these blessed hearts. They were prophetic, truly. He says the chivalrous, the brave Salah al-Din, he was just their leader. And he reflected the masses that were behind him. He said, Salahuddin was faithful to his word and compassionate towards non-combatants, unlike the others who promised, then massacred without conscience. You know, when I think about the heroics of pious restraint, the heroics of humility before Allah Azza wa Jal, you know, I, I always think of Nuruddin Zengi. Nuruddin Zengi, some of you may know who he is, most of you probably don't. They often say in his biography that he was leaps and bounds more pious than Salahuddin. Even if he wasn't as known as Salahuddin. You know, they say that when he was building up the momentum for the liberation of Jerusalem, it took 88 years, right? Even Nuruddin was towards the end of it, towards the climax. They say Nuruddin was a man of unique righteousness. There is an incident where he was forced to, to fight on multiple fronts simultaneously, which was very dangerous. But if he didn't do it, too many of the Franks were going to be able to come south and sabotage the project of liberating Jerusalem. And so the Franks had basically landed in and laid siege to Damietta, which is the northeastern city of Egypt that my, both my parents happened to be from, Dumyat. And when his army reaches there, to give you a glimpse of this man's relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal. Nuruddin, you know, he fell on the ground in a place called Tel Harim, a little hill called Harim. And he, would, he was saying to Allah Azza wa Jal that, Oh Allah, these are your allies. And these are your enemies. So give victory to your allies against your enemies. And don't deprive them because Nuruddin is among them. And people used to say, we have Nuruddin on our side. Nuruddin never loses. And he used to say, who is Nuruddin? Who is the light of the religion? He used to say, oh Allah, dinu dinuk, wal jundu junduk, fafal ya rabbi ma yaliqu bi karamik. The deen is your deen. The army is your army. So do, oh my Lord, what is befitting of your generosity. Gift us this. And one night, he said on Tal Harim, he said, don't deprive them because Nuruddin is among them. Because of my sins, don't punish them. Men, al kalb Nuruddin Mahmud hatta yunsar. His name was Mahmud Nuruddin Zengi. He said, "Who is this dog? I'm a nobody. This dog Nuruddin to be granted victory." And so a scholar saw that night in his dream the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa wasallam. And he said to him, go tell Nuruddin that Allah has heard him say what he said on the hill of Harim. Who is Nuruddin to be given victory? And so the scholar said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how would he ever believe me? He's going to sort of tell the armies, don't worry, go in the opposite direction because some guy saw something in their dream at night. 
ف جيف مي علامه جيف مي ا ساين سو هيل بيليف مي ذات اتس اكشولي يو اتس اكشولي ا جيفت فروم الله ا ديسكلوجر فروم الله عز وجل سو ذا بروفيت صلى الله عليه وسلم سيد تو هيم تيل هيم الله هاز هيرد هيم سي هو از نور الدين ذات دوغ تو بي جيفن فيكتوري اند سو هي ووك اب اند هي راش تو ذا مسجد اند فاوند نور الدين براينج هيز نايت برايرز ان ذا مسجد And he said to him, I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on this night. And he said, Allah has heard. You say, who is Nuruddin? Who is Mahmud? Uh, to be given victory. And he is telling you that they have departed from Dumyat. And he left out the word dog out of respect for the commander. And so Nuruddin was skeptical. And he said to him, say the full dream. So the man put his head down and said, he said, Allah has heard you say, Who is that dog, Mahmoud, to be given victory? So he knew it was a true ru'ya. He true, knew it was a true vision from Allah, a true gift from Allah that is worthy of being acted upon. And so he acted upon it. Decades later, Palestine, Jerusalem, was cleansed of the atrocities that had befallen it. That Nuruddin never lived to see it. that Nuruddin built a pulpit for Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, two of them actually, that Salah al-Din later installed. And decades before Nuruddin, when the massacre first happened, 88 years prior, there was Zain al-Islam al-Harawi, a great scholar from Herat, Afghanistan, who saw the Ummah not moving, busied with themselves. And so he went to the capital city, Baghdad. And he went into the big mosque of Baghdad during Jumu'ah in the daytime of Ramadan. And he stood in front of everyone and he started eating. Dr. Yasser Qadi has an excellent presentation on this on the internet called The Wave That Freed Al-Aqsa. That's how it started. And people flip out, like what kind of monster are you to deliberately, openly, shamelessly eat like that in the daytime of Ramadan? Now he had everybody's attention. He said, you guys are so angry because I eat in the daytime of Ramadan and you're not angry when the Masjid Al-Aqsa is on fire. And so part of heroics also, and with that I will close, is the heroics of not becoming jaded, not becoming numb, not despairing, not becoming complacent. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala write us and you among the 10th of the heroes of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem Allow for us a share, even if it's just in the build-up of how we know the story will end. Allahumma ameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka wa nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.